Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to apologize up front for the way I sound today. Uh, it seems that uh, on Friday, the uh, COVID bug hit me. And I have been down for the count for the last three days. Today is really the first day that I felt even subhuman. So you'll have to pardon me for the way I sound, but hopefully the analysis and the presentation will still be good. So today one of my subscribers asked me to explain the NFL Sunday ticket verdict and the fact that it was overturned by the trial judge. And he asked, how can this happen? Well, there would appear to be a number of different answers to that question, but at the top of the list is a judge who didn't put the work in at the beginning and finding a way to fix his error at the end, if indeed it was an error at all. You see, the principal problem, according to the judge, was that the plaintiff's expert economist's opinion didn't make sense to him. Now, this is from the order granting the defendant's motion for judgment as a matter of law. The judge starts here by pontificating that the judge must ensure that all scientific and testimony or evidence admitted is not only relevant but reliable. He then goes down to say that the court agrees that Dr. Rasher's and Dr. Zona's testimonies based on their flawed methodologies should be excluded because there was no other support for the class-wide injury and damages elements of plaintiff's Section 1 and Section 2 claims. Judgment as a matter of law for the defendants is appropriate. So that's what he based his order on. The judge's main complaint was that Dr. Rasher used college football as his model for what would happen in the absence of the competitive restraints at issue in the case. College football, but for world. I'll explain that in a little bit. In support, he looked to see if it was feasible to do what was happening in college football in the NFL by preparing schedules showing games that actually existed with an NFL schedule on alternate channels where they could have been shown. So that was the but-for world, the world that this expert constructed in order to calculate damages. He says, Defendants have requested a post-trial Daubert review of Dr. Rasher's testimony based on his college football but-for world. Defendants argue that Dr. Rasher's college football but-for world is not the product of reliable economic methodology as it is devoid of any economic reasoning and contrary to both basic economics principles and all the trial testimony offered by witnesses other than Dr. Rasher. Then there's a bit of a self-own here where the court says, while the court previously denied defendant's Daubert motion and the motion in limity on Dr. Rasher's opinion, trial testimony revealed the college football but for world was not a product of sound economic methodology. So let's talk a little bit more about the economics issue. So one of my favorite quotations about economics was the line that Harry Truman used. He said what he really wanted was a one-armed economist. And when someone asked him, well, why do you want a one-armed economist? He said, so they could never say, but on the other hand. It is true that in any profession there are generalities that apply, sort of stereotypes. In medicine, we used to say that the radiologist's national flower is the hedge because they always hedge their opinions saying clinical correlation is needed. In economics, it's the fact that no two of them ever agree on much of anything. Thomas Piketty said that economists tend to think they are much, much smarter than historians, than everybody. And he said this is a bit too much because at the end of the day, we don't know very much in economics. And I think he's right in that analysis. The NFL Sunday ticket case morphed two very different forms of litigation, antitrust and class action, into one case. I worked on one of these, and in much the same way as here, the judge didn't like the economist's economic model. That's because under antitrust law, damages get trebled, and any time you have damages in the billions of dollars, that means the butcher's bill at the end of the day is in the billions of dollars, and it's three times larger than it was when it started. So in that case, with a $4.7 billion judgment, it would have been somewhere around $15 million for the end of the day. 
So no judge wants the distinction of being the first judge to ever sign a judgment for more than $15 billion. So in that case, the judge used, in the case that I was in, the judge used class certification motions to say that the economic model was not admissible and thus the class was not certifiable. There were damages for the principal plaintiff in that case, but having fought for five years to get to that point, those damages didn't even pay the cost of the case at that point. So let's look at what it takes to get a class certified and why that's the hardest part of any class action. Rule 23 says you have to meet a number of criteria. First, the class has to be so numerous that you could not realistically manage all the individual cases. That's numerosity, and that's usually easy to establish, and it was certainly easy for them to establish in the NFL case because they had consumers all across the country. The second requirement is there must be questions of law or fact that are common to the class. This is commonality. And it doesn't have to be both law and fact. It has to be either or, both law or fact, a question of law. Is the antitrust the right remedy here? A question of fact. Did they conspire to defeat market forces? And because of those common questions of law and fact, again, wasn't too hard to do, but it's usually an easy hurdle to beat, even though we'll see it raise its ugly head again here in just a minute. The third requirement is that the claims or defenses of the class representatives are typical of the claims or defenses of the class. Now, that's called typicality, and in a case like the NFL case, it was necessary to segregate commercial purchasers, bars and restaurants, commercial venues, from residential purchasers because the claims of those parties were very different. And that's how you get subclasses inside a class action. Then the last requirement under the first part of the rule is fair and adequate representation. You have to hire really good lawyers, and the lawyers have to have done this kind of thing before, usually have you know, a good reputation for being honest and ethical, and aren't going to make a collusive settlement with the defendant. So none of these were initially designed to make it difficult to set up a class action because class actions are thought of as being more efficient and that's true because individualized claims, if every single person who got cheated in the uh, NFL Sunday ticket litigation were to bring an individual suit, it would tie up the courts for decades. So the four requirements above, Rule 23A requirements, are usually the easy part, even though it doesn't necessarily sound like they're the easy part. That's where Rule 23B throws us a few curves. It says a class may be maintained if you get past Rule 23A and prosecuting separate actions would create a risk of inconsistent or varying adjudications that would create incompatible standards of conduct for the party opposing the class. What that means is, basically, let's suppose that you have two cases, Smith v. Jones in Georgia, where the claims are for antitrust, fraud, and conspiracy, and a Georgia jury finds for the plaintiff and awards $2 million dollars based on a set of evidence that is essentially the same as will be used in other cases. Then, a few months later, in Doe versus Jones, the claims are again the same. The, the evidence and the presentation of the evidence is exactly the same, and a Michigan jury finds for the defendant on the same facts. You've got inconsistent adjudications, and you may also have problems with collateral estoppel. Or, the adjudications with respect to individual class members that as a practical matter would be dispositive of the interests of the other members, not parties to the individual adjudications, or that would substantially impair or impede their ability to protect their interests. So again, what that means is if, if I brought Sunday Ticket, you bought Sunday Ticket, and you took your case to trial, or you took your case in, and you lost, and it was determined that they did not violate antitrust, that might impair or impede my ability to protect my interests in my case. So when you force all the cases together in a class action, it tends to be more efficient, and as a result, you get better and more consistent remedies. The party opposing the class has acted or refused to act on grounds generally applicable to the class, so that final injunctive relief or corresponding declaratory relief is appropriate respecting the class as a whole, or the court finds that common questions of law or fact predominate over questions affecting individual members. 
So assuming you get past Rule 23A, you have two ways to finish certifying your class. You can show that if you find for the plaintiff on an antitrust case, as in this case, that would be dispositive of the other cases. Or you could show that if you held separate trials, there could be separate verdicts that would create incompatible standards. Another way to satisfy the class requirement, and this is the lawyer's meal ticket option, is to show that you're really asking for declaratory relief or injunctive relief. So the defendant doesn't have to pay damages, but they have to be enjoined by virtue of the ruling that the court makes. And in that situation, members of the class don't get anything. They get an injunction, but they don't get any money but the lawyers would get a fee out of that. But the third option that common questions predominate is where most class lawyers go to get a damages class certified, and that means that generally speaking, the class has to have simple damages that are easily calculated by the jury. You can't have individual variances in damages. You can have slight individual damages. If I bought Sunday ticket and then I got a refund halfway through, well, in that situation, I only have six months of damages or six weeks of damages, whatever it is. On the other hand, somebody who had it for the whole time, they've got the full length of time. Well, you can, you can take care of that in class administration, so they don't get too hung up about that. Attacking the common questions of law and fact and the questions of law that predominate or the questions of fact that predominate, that is the way that many of these class actions are defended. In most consumer-based class actions, the big fight is class certification. That's because it has to occur early in the case and it leads to class notice, among other things. If the defendant loses on class certification and the class is certified, then in most cases, the class settlement negotiations begin in earnest, and generally speaking, defendants don't trust juries to spare them when they've cheated the consumer. But in a class action involving antitrust, you have a whole different incentive. You can waive class certification and defend on substance if you have a strong legal argument and you can wipe out the class of claims of all these members in one fell swoop so you won't get sued again. So with that understanding of how generally class claims work, let's talk about antitrust claims. Congress passed the first antitrust law, the Sherman Act, in 1890 as a comprehensive charter of economic liberty aimed at preserving free and unfettered competition as the rule of trade. In 1914, Congress passed two additional antitrust laws, the Federal Trade Commission Act and the Clayton Act. With some revisions, these are the three core federal antitrust laws in effect today, but we're only going to talk about two of them. The Sherman Act outlaws every contract, combination, or conspiracy in restraint of trade and any monopolization, attempted monopolization, or conspiracy or combination to monopolize. Long ago, the Supreme Court decided that the Sherman Act does not prohibit every restraint of trade, only those that are unreasonable. Certain acts are considered so harmful to competition that they're almost always illegal. Those include plain arrangements among competing individuals or businesses to do things like fix prices or divide markets. You take the south side, I'll take the north side. Or rig bids. Okay, we're going to build on this bridge, and we're going to bid on this bridge. We're going to, you know, work out the deal so that you can be my subcontractor, those kinds of things. Those acts are per se violations of the Sherman Act. And in other words, no justification is allowed. The Clayton Act addresses specific practices that the Sherman Act does not clearly prohibit, such as mergers and acquisitions that are in restraint of trade, interlocking directorates, for example, where you have the same person making business decisions for competing companies. Engulf and Devour Company buys Pizza Hut, and it also buys Papa John's. And then they put one guy in charge of making business decisions for both of those entities. And essentially, they can do that and affect the market, because they can fix prices, and if that's the only two places in town that sell pizza. Well, they're going to have an open ticket to write their own. Basically, it's a, it's a license to print money. So interlocking directorates are a big thing, but you don't see that very often anymore. The Clayton Act also prohibits mergers and acquisitions where the effect may be to substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. The Clayton Act also authorizes private parties to sue for triple damages 
when they've been harmed by conduct that violates either the Sherman or Clayton Act and obtain a court order prohibiting the anti-competitive practice in the future. So it would appear that in this case, the matter was certified for class treatment and then it was taken to trial. Prior to trial, the defense made a Daubert challenge to the damages expert used by the plaintiff. I have a video on Daubert and I will link it up here. Essentially, under Daubert, your expert has to provide a reliable opinion, and I think many of us in the law feel like Daubert is just a license to federal judges to exclude evidence they don't like or experts they don't like. Essentially, the defendants challenged his methodology as unreliable. The trial judge overruled their motion pre-trial and let the expert testify. Now, if, when the expert began testifying and stating his opinions, and his opinions are evidence under our system, the judge realized that his methodologies didn't make sense, well, the judge could have stopped him right there and say, what do you base that on? And if he didn't like the answer, he could have struck the testimony and the case would have fallen apart right there. But instead, he allowed this to go all the way to the jury. And at the close of the testimony by the expert, he could have also said, Let's talk to the lawyers in the back room and told them that he was going to strike the testimony and there would have been no judgment at all. But he didn't do that either. He didn't do that because apparently he didn't think that the testimony was too far off the mark. You see, in an antitrust case, you have to predict what the world would have been like but for the anti-competitive arrangement at issue. And you have to do that in order to assess damages. In other words, if before Sunday ticket it would have cost you $30 to watch the NFL games you wanted to watch, and now because of Sunday ticket it's going to cost you $90, well, your damages are $60. The problem with that is it requires you to be a good science fiction writer. So think about that. What do science fiction writers do? They create alternative possible universes, and they have coherent rules that conform to known physics. And that's essentially what an economist is trying to do with our real world. The expert has to predict what would have happened had the direct TV deal not been done. Here he predicted that it would be a lot like college football, and you could likely get your local NFL game on one of the local over-the-air or cable stations if the NFL hadn't locked up the market. The expert testified and the case went to the jury room. Then the jury came back and hit the company with $4.7 billion in judgment, and the judge realized that after traveling, he'd be well at over $14, million, or $14 billion, and he'd probably be awarding fees in excess of $5 million. Suddenly, the judge was worried that his handling of this case might raise alarm bells, so after the defendant filed his motion for relief from judgment and judgment as a matter of law, the judge granted it. He then criticized the jury for awarding too much money. The judge said even though even if the court did not find that the judgment as a matter of law was appropriate, the court would have vacated the jury's damages verdict, remitted defendants' award to nominal damages, and conditionally granted a new trial based on the jury's irrational damages award. The court also said, nevertheless, the court is concerned about whether the jury's damages verdict can stand. Generally, the jury's award of damages is entitled to great deference and should be upheld unless it's clearly not supported by the evidence or only based on speculation or guesswork. Here, the jury awarded damages to the cent, and basic arithmetic shows their methodology. Dividing the awards, as shown, it looks like the they divided the subscriptions by the total number of commercial subscriptions and came up with a list price offered to residential consumers. In 2018 and 2019, the jury then subtracted 10274 the calculation for the average price paid by the residential Sunday ticket, and then they just did the math, and you can see it broken down there in that table, and the court found that that was inappropriate because he had given different jury instructions. And he says as much, the court cautioned that while a jury may determine the average overcharge by class members or estimate the overcharge by class members, it must have the average or estimate on the evidence and reasonable inferences, not on guesswork or speculation. But there are some things left out. Consider this. The evidence before the jury, yeah, that evidence that the judge only later deemed to be inadmissible, fully supported a verdict up to $7 billion. That's right in the opinion. If there is an error in the jury's calculation, it isn't from being outside the evidence. They were well under that at $4.7 billion. 
It was from the judge allowing them to hear that evidence in the first place, which is the judge's error. However, or I should say moreover, this is complete speculation on the judge's part. He did not call the jury in and poll them on this issue and say, how did you reach your, your verdict? He isn't allowed to do that. He just did a judicial mind reading. If anyone is missing evidence for their analysis, it's the judge here. This is a bad judicial decision. When Congress directed that all class action lawsuits over a certain dollar amount that were not primarily tied to one state be handled in federal court, the theory was it would create a cadre of judges who were better versed in handling these complex cases. But there's no reason to believe that a federal judge is any more or less capable than a state judge in antitrust areas. And worse, because so much of what happens in federal court happens without lawyers getting a chance to verbally argue their positions, the playing field favors the defense in most respects. Now you may ask, does this mean that the case is over? Most likely not. The plaintiffs are surely going to appeal to the Ninth Circuit, but it's an uphill challenge. First, no one, not even federal judges, really understand economics. Now, my son will probably argue with me here because he has a degree in economics, and I'm sure he understands it. All you need to do is look around to see that while certain sides on the political spectrum were telling you that massive federal spending wouldn't cause inflation because their economists said so, and the other side said that their economists claimed it would cause inflation, that it's pretty clear that economists can be wrong. So, in the unlikely event that some judge on the Ninth Circuit is actually a savant in the area of forensic economics and takes a sincere issue in addressing this problem, there is some possibility the Ninth might reverse and remand for entry of judgment. But a ruling on the basis of Daubert is a discretionary decision, and it can only be reversed if reasonable minds could not disagree. While the Ninth Circuit might well overturn this, the defendants would still always have the ability to go to SCOTUS for another bite at the apple. So that's what I have for you today. Again, I apologize for the voice. Uh, if you have the opportunity today, do something kind for someone. <laughs> If you know somebody who has COVID, make them some chicken soup or some pho, uh, something that will go a long way to making them feel better. I had pho last night, first time I could really eat anything that tasted really good to me, and it was absolutely delightful. So uh, I fully recommend that. After you've had an opportunity to do that, drop some comments down below. Let me know what you think about this rather interesting case. You can also email me at the address above. Thank you so much for watching. When you're done, come on back tomorrow. Join me down here at the beach and we'll talk about something else interesting. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.